leave it up to you. Okay, awesome. Um, hey guys, thank you so much um, for joining me, like Meredith said, for the third session in this four-part series about readiness, about professional development, about professional etiquette. Um, today we're going to go over uh, social media and networking. Um, this is not your usual social media. Um, I am not checking your Facebook. I am not checking your Instagram. I'm not checking your Twitter. In terms of social media, I'm talking about LinkedIn and your presence on LinkedIn because it's so important in 2021 because you can't meet recruiters in person that you have a strong virtual um, presentation of yourself. Okay, so we'll go over um, how to how to deal with networking in person, virtually, and then social media that LinkedIn. Um, half. Today's session is not going to be super long. We should be kind of out of here by 5 o'clock, 5.10 at the latest. Um, if you guys have any questions, like we've done the last couple series, uh, last couple of Wednesdays, pop them in the chat and then we can get to them at the end of the of the presentation whenever the question comes up pop them in the chat and then I'll I'll just read them all out at the end because I don't want you guys keeping on to that question until the end and then you forget about it while you're typing it up at the very end so just keep popping them in as um, as we go through so let's get started um So like we've done the last couple sessions, we do a value moment or a safety moment. It's just Halvern protocol to be doing so. So I thought today that we could do, we could touch on mental health with college students. 30% um, of college students in 2020 reported that stress had a negative effect on their academic performance. Um, 40 million U.S. adults suffer from an anxiety disorder, 75% of that 40 million experienced their first episode of anxiety at the age of 22. So that's prime college age. You know, you're just getting out into the workforce or you're finishing up your senior or junior year. Um, that's when you are more affected uh, or easily affected by anxiety. 85% um, of college students reported that they felt overwhelmed by everything they've had to do at some point within the past year. And I'm sure that number is much higher. I just don't think a lot of people like to accept or admit that they suffer from anxiety. But it's so common, you guys. Everybody goes through those moments. Seeking help is so important. So how do you seek that help? If you're on campus, talk to the psychology or behavioral health department at, at ASU. Um, they might have counseling sessions with graduate students. Uh, usually if they do, those sessions are free because they are just graduate students. Um, you can talk, if you live on campus, you can talk to your RA um, or you can, you know, confide in a friend, a professor or a mentor, anybody that you feel comfortable with. You can even ask one of those people to go with you when you're trying to find a professional health counselor, um, or they can come with you, provide you that support um, that sometimes that's all you really need uh, to get started. If you're off campus, you can visit your family physician. They can treat you or refer you to somebody that specializes in mental health because there's so many buckets within mental health um, that people and therapists uh focus on. Uh, you can also find a local support group, right? Through counseling centers, hospitals, community centers, places of worship, um, or host support groups yourself with your own friends, your own community, kind of on campus or off. 
So you guys already know who I am. Most of you know who I am. I did see a couple of new names in the participant chat. So I thought I'd introduce myself. My name is Amanda Martins. Um, I am a proud University of Houston Cougar. I've not uh, attended ASU on an academic level. I'm currently in Texas A&M pursuing my master's. Uh, and I'm a, sec I'm a second generation Halbert employee. Um, my dad's been working for the company for 37 years. I have two brothers that work for the company. So I always like to joke that working with, with Halliburton or working for Halliburton um, was always going to happen one way or the other. Currently, I cover um, a ton of different schools. I cover ASU, um, I cover Texas A&M, I cover Prairie View A&M, University of Texas El Paso, OU and Texas Tech. So let's get straight into it. Let's focus on networking first. Um, so what is it, right? This is a question that I often get. Um, Amanda, what is networking? It is so different. The one thing I do want to focus on for you guys is that it's so different from a career fair. It's so different from an info session. It's so different from an interview. So you have to be sure that you're treating networking events very differently. I always like to call it like a resource library. Um, usually networking events have people from all different generations, people from all different industries attending. Um, and because it's the room is filled with so much knowledge and education, this is a place where you can really, if you are stuck on a problem at school or stuck on a personal matter or a professional matter, networking sessions are ways for you to gain knowledge and insights that you wouldn't have probably thought about or probably have even discussed with your friends. It gives you that outside opinion um, and it's a really, really great tool for you to get to know this industry professionals, get to know yourself, find out a little bit more about any concerns that you might have it's a really, really great tool that I think a lot of students don't take advantage of. Um, usually networking sessions are held th before the career fair um, on campus. So they might be the week before career fair. They might be the day before career fairs, but usually it's around that time period. So I said, you know, they're very different. Networking events and career fairs are very different. So what is what are the big differences, right? So networking events gives you a place where you can potentially seek mentorship from people that are more experienced in the industry. Um, you can always go to them and have a quick conversation, get to know a little about them, about their career path. Usually when seasoned professionals are attending attending networking sessions, they're looking for potential new mentees to take under their wing. So I highly, highly suggest you take advantage of it. Um, it allows you to build social skills, right? Having a discussion on a professional platform you're not using shorthand talk, right? You're not saying LOL or you're not... Um, handling it like a conversation like you would your best friend. Um, it's a professional um, event where you need to act professionally and attending networking sessions allows you to brush up on those skills. And then lastly, it allows you to gain industry insight. Usually networking sessions are split up by industry. Um, and so They'll have talks about the latest equipment or the newest uh, technologies that are coming up. And if you are, let's say you're a mechanical engineer, right? You are attending a mechanical engineering networking event. You're going to be learning about the new processes for mechanical engineering that could potentially help you in your own day-to-day -day work right? The same thing goes if you are in a finance department and you're wanting to, you're attending a networking session about, you know, finance, um, about accounting, about CPAs, all that good stuff. For every industry, there is a networking event or a networking series or something or the other. At a career fair, your main purpose 
this is to find a job or an internship, right? You are going there with a purpose to do so. This is the place where you're going to showcase your skills and your talents. Um, you're going to talk about yourself. You're going to brag about yourself a little bit more. Um, and that's all to do with the purpose of getting that internship or job. Networking sessions are not a place for you to uh, be handing out your resume. It is not a place to, for you to um, kind of ask if they are hiring and how do I get on Get to, get to that job or get to that role, potentially it might lead you down that path, but that is not the purpose of networking sessions. That is the purpose of career fairs. So when you're at a career fair, the number one thing that I would just suggest for you guys to do is to have your resume ready and proofread. That is so, so, so important. You guys don't know how many candidates have actually slipped through the cracks because they have a typo in their phone number or their email. And oftentimes as a recruiter, when a student has a typo in their email, or their cell phone number, if I've reached out to you a couple times and I'm not getting a response back and that's because of the typo, I'm going to move on to the next candidate. I'm not going to find you uh, through you know, social media and then message you on there, try to see if we can get scheduled for an interview. Um, usually I'm just going to try to contact you on your cell phone first and potentially maybe your email. So make sure all that information is correct on your resume. So how do you engage appropriately at networking sessions? I talked about how they're so different, um, networking sessions and career fairs. And so because they're so different, you have to engage differently in networking sessions. So when you are introducing yourself, right, this introduction needs to be super casual in the aspect where you're talking to potentially a professor. I wouldn't make it super casual where you're talking to your best friend. And so if you, you go in with a strong handshake, fresh breath also always helps, uh, but you give a quick introduction about yourself, right? Um, hi, my name is Amanda Martins. I'm a junior um, mechanical engineer at Angelo State University. A quick, easy introduction that gives me the main points about yourself. Um, I always like to add in the, how's your day going? What are you up to? How are you enjoying tonight's event? That one, that one sentence, that one question really sets the tone for the rest of the conversation. Um, and it, the more like casual and less formal you are with it, I'll tell you guys, the easier that the recruiter is going to talk to you. When you make it super stuffy, those introductions, the recruiter is also going to be kind of st stiff and um, correspondence might go a little bit slower than you were expecting. So if you ask that introductory question, how's it going today? How are you enjoying tonight's event? That's a really great way to start that conversation. When you're responding, you are going to, I always tell students, try to add a personal fact about you um, in the response. Find something that relates to your recruiter uh, or the person that you're talking to at this networking event, right? If they respond back to your introduction and say, hey, hey yeah, tonight's event events is going really great. I'm so excited to be here, um, but I am missing out, you know, on, on the on the Cowboys game. Well, you can you can respond to that and say, oh, you're a Cowboys fan. Well, blah, 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 blah. Here's how I relate to the Cowboys. Or if they say, um, you know, yeah, tonight's event, I'm so excited. I flew down from Houston for this event. You can say, whoa, you're from Houston. This is, I, I love Houston. I went here. Um, are you a Texans fan? You can tie it into a little bit more of a personal conversation because I always feel like a networking session, if you tie it a little bit more personally, recruiters or, you know, prof industry professionals will remember you a lot stronger than if you were purely there just to sell yourself to potentially get an internship or a job. Um, if you have that casual conversation with them, they're more likely to talk to you and be a little bit more easygoing, like I said before. 
my my kind of favorite thing uh, to ask personally and what students have asked me is when we when I'm talking, oh, yeah, I came from Houston to this event and a student has asked me, oh, so you're the new you're new to the San Angelo area. Can I recommend, you know, a couple restaurants or can I uh, you know recommend a site to see something so silly about that can take you so much further from that conversation, when you potentially meet them again at the career fair, you can say, hey, I'm not sure if you remember me, but I gave you that recommendation for this restaurant. Did you by chance check it out and have the opportunity to eat there? And in their mind, they're automatically linking you to a positive event that they've had. They've had good food and they remember you because of that recommendation a week before at this networking event. So Think about that. Don't make it all about professional school, very uptight and stiff. When you're ending the conversation, I always like to say, hey, I'm so excited to see you um, at the career fair, or I'm excited to see you at the next networking event. Uh, I'll catch you later. If you, you, if you leave it to the, I'll see you at the next blank, 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 they'll be expecting you at the next blank, blank, blank. Um, so I, it's, it's a really great way to continue on that conversation. This whole introduction response ending, this whole engagement with the recruiter or the industry professional, you guys, is not going to take longer than 10 minutes. If you try and take longer than 10 minutes, the recruiter is going to get a little flustered because there's a line of people behind you, right? Trying to talk to that person. So they're already, they're getting flustered, flustered because they have to talk to everybody else. They're already kind of bored of the conversation after 10 minutes. So I think 10 minutes or less is a great interaction time or first time interaction time um, when talking to that industry professional or recruiter, all right? So some tips and tricks on um, just succeeding in this type of networking event. So choosing the right networking event is so important. Um, if you, I always bring this up about mechanical engineers. If you are a mechanical engineer and you are attending a networking se session for finance students, it's really not going to help you, right? There are the people at the networking events. A, they're you're not going to understand what they're talking about. Uh, B, they're probably the recruiters. They are probably looking to hire accounting or finance students. They aren't looking to hire mechanical students. Um, so it's not it's not worth your time. Um, so try to find industry related events. Or I would suggest try to attend um, networking sessions that you potentially want to get into, right? The field that you potentially want to get into. So if you're a mechanical engineer looking to get into uh, the tech field, go to a tech networking event. If you are a finance student wanting to get into, um, you know, big four accounting firms, then go to a big four networking event. Um, go to a manufacturing event if you are wanting to get into manufacturing. Picking and choosing your networking events will make your time there feel so much more worth it rather than you attending every single networking event event that the career center or the industry has and then getting irritated when it doesn't turn up anything, right? It's not worth your time. Uh, picking and choosing the right events is so important. Sweaty hands. This is more for in-person networking sessions. Uh, I would just recommend just wiping your hands on your pants right before going to shake someone's hand. Um, I've had students, you know, sometimes it, it, you can't help it that you get nervous and sweaty. I totally understand that. But in the age of COVID and people just being germaphobes, um, if you just wipe your hands, if they're sweaty on your pants or your shirts before going in for a handshake will make such a big difference. You do not want to be known as a person with the sweaty hands. It's not a good look. 
cautions for food. Usually at networking events, there is food there, right? Um, I always tell students, stick to food that you can eat and chew and swallow quickly and have a conversation, um, especially foods that are not messy or um, have high probabilities of messing up your clothes, right? Um, I always stick to the cookies and the vegetables rather than the wings that you'll need a napkin and then your breath might be garlicky. Um, so cookies, vegetables, fruits work perfectly for those types of events stick away from the garlic hummus the uh the wings all that good stuff that you can potentially have maybe later on in the night once you're done interacting with all these um people the, i would also caution on drink right usually networking sessions sometimes have alcohol. Uh, if you're going to have alcohol, that's completely fine, but make it a one drink limit. You don't want to overdo it and then get um, sloppy at a networking session. That is also not a good look to have. Um, if you don't feel comfortable drinking, that's perfect fine. Don't feel forced. Like you have to have an alcoholic beverage because other people are at this event. Have some water, have some soda, have a soft drink, whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, you should not be trying out new boundaries at networking events. Uh, don't test them out. Lastly, so my last tip for professional for for um, networking events is professional pickup lines. This is not your usual pickup line that you would work on a person <laughs> that you are um, romantically interested in. A professional pickup line is a quick one sentence grabber um, to to get the recruiter or industry professional interested in you, right? Um, I kind of talked about in the last slide about making that personal response, giving that introduction to a restaurant or a, um, a football game or something similar. This is exactly that, that professional pickup line is that personal connection that you can make to the recruiter or that industry professional. Um, it can be as casual as, you know, um, I, I saw that you are a, a, a manager as a mechanical engineer. Can you tell me a little bit about your processes or can you tell me what interests you or why did you join Halliburton? Why did you join Tesla? Something that's very casual that people don't mind speaking about, but also engages them with you on that personal level. Okay. So networking online. Virtual networking, some best practices, dress code. When you are virtually networking, you are going to have your camera on, okay? Um, when you're virtually networking, you're going to be able to dress up and dress down. Um, I talked about it in last week's um, readiness section about making sure you dress from head to toe just in case you have to stand up. Uh, same thing again out of virtual virtual networking. Make sure you dress from head to toe. You don't know if during the networking session someone barges in and you have to close the door or your doorbell rings and you have to answer it. Um, and if you are just dressed from um, head to waist, once you stand up, your pajama pants are seen and it's not a good look. So just be careful. Dress from head to toe for these virtual networking events. And then as soon as the networking event is over, you are good to go to get back into your pajama set. Internet connection and logging in early. Um, it, internet connection, sometimes you can't help it, right? When the power goes out or your internet stumbles, it happens. But if you log in early, I would say like five to 10 minutes before the event starts, you can usually hammer out all these uh, problems. You can also have backups, right? If you have a hotspot tethering device on your phone or if you have an Ethernet that cord. You can always have that handy just to plug in super quick. Uh, and these can be can these can be caught early on if you log in a little bit early. Minimum distractions. I know that my attention span 
is like a goldfish. The minute I see something flashy uh, kind of pop up, my uh, my mind is automatically redirected and I am not thinking clearly. I have to get back on the subject and it takes me a little bit of time. So what I've started doing just to minimize my distractions is putting my computer on, um, on do not disturb I also, I don't get any email notifications. I don't get any Spotify notifications. I don't get any Teams notifications or Zoom notifications. I put everything on Do Not Disturb when I'm at an event. I also put my phone on Do Not Disturb and I put it face down so I don't see my screen lighting up. Um, As soon as the event is over, usually networking events are no longer than an hour. As soon as they're over, you can get back to your phone or back to that um, that distraction. Um, And that way you've put your best foot forward when talking to the recruiter, because I promise you, they're keeping an eye and they're looking to see who is not paying attention or who is doing something else. It's not a good look. This no phones kind of goes back to those minimum distractions, put it on do not disturb, put it face down, focus all your attention on the event or on the recruiter. And then lastly is staying engaged, right? This kind of ties in with the last two, the phone thing. Um, Staying engaged is just giving your 100% attention to the recruiter, to the industry professional. Um, They they're giving you advice or they're talking to you or having their, they're having that connection with you. If you are not staying engaged with them, it's really a waste of their time. Um, They're not going to look favorably upon you. They are going to be kind of irritated because they could have talked to somebody else that probably or possibly was a little bit more um, excited about the opportunity or the event. So think about that. Um, if you are, if the event is not something that you want to be in, when you log in, you're like, oh man, I thought this was going to be something else. This is really not for me. That's totally okay. Just put your camera off and then log off. Not a big deal. You don't have to make a huge announcement to it. Um, you don't have to, you know, let the recruiter know and say, Hey, I'm actually going to leave. Nope. Just put your camera off (laughs) and log off. Not a big deal. They're not going to get their feelings hurt. I promise. And that's not a bad look for you either. If you've made the conscious decision to log off, not a bad look for you. That's just, you were doing what was in your best interest. So networking via LinkedIn, a few things I talked about, you know, that social media platform, we're getting into it right now. So the first thing you're going to do is update your profile, you guys. Make sure you have a current picture of yourself. Make sure your title is correct, right? If you are an intern in the summer and you're no longer working for that position or that company any longer, why is that your title still on LinkedIn, right? You guys are students. Your current title, if you're not working, should be um, current student at Angelo State University. Um, Small details like that make a big difference. So make sure your profile is updated. Adding relevant connections, you guys are going to feel super, super tempted to add anyone and everyone under the sun. So it looks like your LinkedIn is current and bopping and it is very like you have a lot of connections. That's that's so awesome. No, uh, the more connections you have, the more problems it entails. I'll be very honest. Um, Adding relevant connections is so important when starting out that social media life. Um, on LinkedIn, you need to be adding people that are going to upgrade yourself, right? Are they people that are potentially wanting to get into, are they people that are potentially in the industry that you want to join? Are they people that might be in the same company that you want to join, right? And you're just keeping tabs on any new developments within the company. Are you adding, you know, classmates and friends that are elevating your LinkedIn? Um, Are they liking and commenting things that you support and that the message you want, you support? Um, Because 
everything that you guys like or your connections like will pop up on your for you page on LinkedIn. So just be aware of that. Um, so like I said, at the, at the end of the day, just don't add everyone and anyone under the sun. Make sure you're making relevant, consistent connections that are going to elevate you in the long term. Third, making the first move. I'll go more in depth about this in the next slide, but the main purpose of this is when you're adding that relevant connection, make sure you are also adding a note to that connection um, just so that you can introduce yourself, right? Make sure it's not all strangers just adding each other for the sake of it. Um, stand out to that connection, especially if it's somebody that, like I said, in the, is in the industry that you're interested in or in the company that you're interested in. I'll go a little bit more in depth about it in the next slide. Um, fourth, maintaining those connections, right? Once you've added the connection, are you no longer interacting with them? Are you no longer liking, commenting, sending them a message? If you're not, what was the point in adding that connection in the first place, right? I always say maintain, this re with, maintain those relationships, maintain those connections, because you never know what can happen. They might say, hey, they might have a new job or new internship pop up and you might say, hey, I know this kid. They they had messaged me on LinkedIn a couple of times. They've made that connection with me. I think they'd be a great candidate for that. So you're you're there the forefront of the of their minds every time you make that connection again. Whether it's you know just sending them a small message on LinkedIn saying, "Hey, um, how's it going? I know that you guys are getting ramping up back for the recruitment process for next summer. I was hoping that we could speak, have some time, and have a conversation about what you're looking for in a candidate." Um, or it's you know double checking on them after you've made that connection at a networking event, you can shoot them a message and say, hey, um, I was wondering if you liked, if you potentially had, could, if you potentially went to that restaurant recommendation that I gave you, right? Um, that professional pickup line is maintaining that connection again. Um, so, so, so important. Lastly, watch your activity. Whatever you like, whatever you comment, pops up on other people's for you pages. Um, I always like to tell students there was a connection that I made a couple of years ago with, uh, with a very important person from this school. Um, and I added them on LinkedIn, didn't think anything about it. Then a few weeks later, they had commented on somebody's post saying, comment here if you're looking for a new job. And they had commented. And in my mind, I'm already thinking, oh, well, this person's looking for a new job. That's interesting. And this person probably thought that they, that nobody would know that they commented on there. So just be aware that people can see what you're doing on LinkedIn, see what they what they're liking, see what they are commenting, adding, uh, resharing. These are all just super and super important things to keep in touch or keep in the forefront of your mind. So like I said, we're going to just do a quick deeper dive into making that first move. So this is a message that you would send when adding a connection, right? That first note to that connection. So every message should start with your name, your school, classification, and major. So if I was reaching out to another HR professional when I was in college, that first line of the message would say, hi, my name is Amanda Martins. I'm a junior at the University of Houston, majoring in human resource development, right? It's a quick synopsis of who I am. I'm then in my next sentence going to state my purpose for contacting that individual, for adding that relevant connection, right? So the next sentence is going to say, I wanted to reach, reach out and see if I could learn more about your career path. 
Now, this sentence can change depending on why you want to add that relevant connection. I wanted to reach out and see if you had any opportunities within your team. I wanted to reach out and see if you could put me in touch with a recruiter. I wanted to reach out and see blank, 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 blank. What is your purpose for contacting them? It should be the second sentence of this initial contact, okay? For my purposes, I'm just saying I wanted to reach out and see if I could learn more about your career path. That very last sentence, and I'm telling you guys, this, this first message should not be longer than three sentences. You go any more than that, the recruiter is not going to see that pop up on their page. They're, not gonna, they're more than likely not going to respond if it's super, super long. So that third message, that third sentence is going to end with what you expect to gain from the whole reason of contacting them or adding them as a relevant connection. So I'm going to say, if you have some free time on Friday, June 18th in the morning, I would love to jump on a call with you and pick your mind. Let me know your thoughts. My best advice on this, you guys, is to be super, super specific. The more specific you are with the person, they're more likely to say yes or to give you a deep answer, right? So they might respond back and say, Hey, Amanda, I don't have time on Friday, June 18th in the morning. How about, you know, Thursday, June 17th um, at 3 p.m.? They're going to give you alternatives. Um, so if you're very specific with that message, the, the more specific they are going to be back with you. Um, so yeah, if you're, if the connection sends you a message back and says, hey, I can't actually meet with you. I'm so sorry. I'm so busy this week. We are rolling out with this new technology or this new equipment or whatever. Um, that's totally okay. The person is a busy working professional. They might not have a lot of free time. That's totally, totally okay. So you can ask a follow-up question so you can maintain that connection with them. Okay, so you can say, thank you for your reply. I totally understand. Would you be okay if I sent a list of my questions about your career path by email? Now, they are more than likely going to give you their email or they're going to say, hey, why don't you shoot me the questions on LinkedIn? Either is okay, but you're maintaining that connection, right? You're keeping in contact with them. You're having that um, that relationship build and gather and grow with that person, the more you ask, or the more you connect with them. Um, I'll tell you guys, I have, there have been candidates that didn't have the best resume because they were sophomores and they didn't have the internship experience or they were seniors and they had something going on personally that they couldn't get internships, um, as a sophomore or a junior, or they just, um, had a weak resume. That's totally cool. Um, but because they've maintained that relationship and maintained that connection with me by checking in with me on LinkedIn, by checking with me at virtual networking events or in-person networking events, and they've maintained those connections with me, I have gone to bat for them as a recruiter. I've said, hey, you have to interview this kid. They might not have the best resume, but they're persistence, their tenacity is what we are looking for in a candidate. Okay. So I'm telling you guys, it works if you are professional, polite, and persistent in your approach to get an internship or a full-time offer. So um, a lot of times when you are interacting at a networking event, whether it's in person or virtually, um, you have the ability to swap business cards. But sometimes as a student, you might not have a business card. It's a-okay, totally fine. Most students don't have a business card. What you can do, what you have in the pocket of your pants, your skirt, your shorts is, is your cell phone. With your cell phone, hopefully it's a smartphone. If it is, you should have the LinkedIn app up and ready at networking events. You can, you can add connections through there from industry professionals super, super quick. So you don't have to search names. You don't have to search um, spellings and all of the jazz, especially if names are super common or super unique. 
it gets a little bit messy. So if you want to bring out your phone when you're maintaining, when you're creating those connections for the first time, add them on LinkedIn through the QR code. It saves you so much time and trouble in the long run. So if you are going to get your QR code and how do you get it? You're going to pull up that LinkedIn app on your phone. You're going to hit the three little boxes um, at the very, very top at the search bar. It's going to pop up to a second page with your LinkedIn QR code where you can scan somebody else's QR code or you can hit my QR code and that last page, it'll pop up on there. I told you guys in the first instance of today of the series that you can add this QR code, save it and add it to your resume and you can actually allow people to connect with you through there on your resume or people can just scan it through your cell phones totally okay. Um, but this is a great alternative. If you guys don't have business cards, just have your QR code up and ready to make that connection that way. So I wanted to talk about easy apply versus regular applications on LinkedIn. A lot of students don't know about easy apply. And I think it's, it's a really, really great source for you guys just to really understand stand it um, going forward. So if you are applying for a job as an engineering specialist and you're trying to apply through LinkedIn, perfectly okay. So you're going to go in that search bar, you're going to hit jobs, that little briefcase at the very, very top of your page. You're going to type in what you're looking for and the location. You're going to hit search. Okay, that's the basic, basic information out there. And the jobs are going to populate at the, at the bottom, right? On the left, they're going to have, you know, quality engineering specialists from HKA Enterprises in Maryland. Then it has engineering specialists at Noblest. Then it has software engineering specialists at Baker Hughes, so on and so forth. It's going to auto-populate with pages of job openings. But do you guys see where HK Enterprises is, that quality engineering specialist, that very first job, it has a very, it, at the very bottom of that job posting, it has easy apply and a little LinkedIn app picture at the, next to it. When, when it has easy apply on there, easy apply is a great tool for you to just do mass applications for. Once you see that, if you click it and you hit easy apply, it's just going to pop up a separate window with this information that is already populated and been taken from your page, your home page on LinkedIn. It's going to auto populate with your name, your phone number, your resume, because you've already added it to your LinkedIn page. Um, and that's all you have to do to submit an application. This is already auto-populated. They've done all the work for you. So take advantage of your easy apply. So if you are in the car waiting for your spouse uh, to fill up the gas um, and you are in your, in your car waiting, hop on LinkedIn on your phone. Easy apply to some jobs because you everything is auto-populated. All you need to do is hit submit application. It literally takes two seconds and it gets your application out there. So please take advantage of it if you get the chance. I also do want to pop just really quick. It has the very bottom of that extra window that pops up before you hit submit application. It says follow the company to stay up to date with their page. If this is a company that you are super excited about, right? If you are a finance or an accounting um, major and you really, really want to follow big four accounting firms, if you are easy applying for EY or Deloitte, you can just hit follow. And then anytime the company has an update or they have a new technology or a new post, that'll all always auto populate your for you page so you that so that you are aware of those advancements within the company. Just a really quick way to stay on top of companies that you're interested in or companies that you potentially want to join full time. 
So setting up and managing job alerts. You guys need to take advantage of this again. Um, this is if you feel like you have applied for every single position, it seems like, um, and you are still not getting anything, and you're not finding any new jobs, setting up and managing your job alerts will give you access to to say, hey, this is a new job that's popped up. So this is a new something new that I've not applied for, let me go ahead and apply it. So how do you get those job alerts? You're going to go back to that job function um, tab on LinkedIn's homepage. You're going to hit jobs. You're going to hit job alert. You're going to kind of fill in exactly what you're looking for, right? So engineering specialist in the United States, I'm going to hit search. I'm going to hit job alert on. Okay, right now it's off because I'm not really looking for any engineering specialist jobs. But if I was, I would hit job alert on and oops, sorry. And it's going to basically, like I said, auto populate with jobs that are coming up um, that are new that you haven't applied for. Um, it'll say, you know, three job, three new jobs have been posted, four new jobs have been posted. And this is something that you can keep in your back pocket for the future, right? Um, those new jobs that populate, you can work with them, you can apply at your, le at your leisure, but it's just something for you to be aware of, especially when you feel um, exhausted when you apply to a ton of jobs. I've been in the same boat as you guys. I feel that pain. Um, and so making sure your job alerts are on is so important and it feels like your time is worth it. Knowing how much you're worth. Um, a lot of students ask me, they say, hey, Amanda, I checked on Glassdoor. And the minute the students say Glassdoor, I say, I hate Glassdoor with a burning passion of a thousand suns. Um, Glassdoor, I think, is, is it's updated with not correct information or it has information that is years late. Um, I always suggest students to check out LinkedIn when knowing when trying to negotiate salaries or trying to figure out how much they should get paid hourly, so on and so forth. Um, LinkedIn is a great, great, great tool for you guys to, to do this. And it's free. Glassdoor, you have to pay past a certain page. LinkedIn is free. So how do you go about finding, knowing how much you're worth on LinkedIn? You're going to hit jobs again on that homepage of LinkedIn. You're going to hit salary. So it goes my jobs, job alerts, salary. You're going to hit salary and a new whole window is going to pop up. Okay. This is LinkedIn salaries page. It's a whole, it's a, it seems like a whole different website. It kind of is, um, but it's a great, great tool for you guys to get this knowledge about. So if I wanted to figure out how much an engineering associate was making in the United States, I type in that information and it would give me a salary range. It would say they've, they've reported salaries from $50,000 a year to $90,000 a year. This is the medium. They also have more insights as to what is base pay versus what are bonuses, what is the bonus structure, all that good site insight. And that can help you when negotiating your pay, um, when negotiating your pay for full time or even potentially internships, right? They do have hourly wages on there as well. So if you typed in engineering intern, they do have an hourly um, wage distributor. Um, so definitely a really, really great tool for you guys to take advantage of. I would, my only piece of advice on this would be to be very specific in your location. Um, I put, you know, I put engineering associate in the United States, but if I were you, I put engineering associate in Houston, Texas, or I put engineering associate in Texas or Dallas, or specifically just in California, wherever you plan on finding a job, because I'll tell you, 
just based on that engineering associate salary, 90K a year is great, but that will never happen in Texas. That's probably going to be in California where the cost of living is super, super high. So they have to extend the um, salary, right? But that's what happens when you put the location as the whole United States rather than being specific to your region or to your state. So my best advice on that is just to be very specific to your region or state or city. That is all that I have for you guys today. That was, I feel like a lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, I know that there were, there are a few questions that have popped up, so I will get to them uh, super quick. All right, so um, somebody asked, what networking techniques do you recommend to someone who is more introverted, does not think quickly in social situations, and is drained by social interactions? That's a great, great, great question, you guys. Um, unfortunately, I feel like networking sessions, they are an extrovert's game. Um, if you are an introvert, I would probably tell you to pick very specific networking sessions where you know it's not going to be um, attended by a ton of people or, you know, mass students. I would also probably say um, if you're going to attend a networking event, see if you can get the list of attendees beforehand and you can pick out the specific people that you want to talk to um, rather than expanding your energy on people that you're not interested in or didn't think about wanting to interact with them. That would probably be my only advice for introverts. Um, I feel like I can't give you a personal answer on that just because I am an extrovert, but I feel for you um, and I hope that helped. Um, somebody asked, is it better to be quiet and listen or try to say something at the end uh, and end up speaking at the same time or over somebody? I think you need to play the, play the field a little bit. Um, if that makes sense. Um, you have to test out the situation. If the, if the recruiter is going to be talking a lot, um, listen, be a little bit more quiet and then provide insight or feedback at the end to say, uh, I mean, not feedback about the, the way that they were talking, but provide their answers um, towards the end. Uh, you kind of have to know what the person is like um, as you're responding to them. I'm an extrovert. I talk a lot, especially at networking events. So a lot of students are quiet when they're speaking to me. But some of my counterparts, the engineering managers, are more quiet. So they're wanting you to have that conversation with them. So you really have to feel it out per person that you're speaking to. I hope that answers that question. Um, um, how do you recommend getting the past the bias for younger workers? I don't think that there is a bias for younger workers. At least I would hope not. Um, I, I really don't think that there is a bias for younger workers. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure about the question, I think, itself. If you want to expand a little bit more on the question, I would appreciate it. But if not, I don't think that there is a bias for younger workers. Um, somebody asked, what are good ways to establish a networking event on your own? That's a really great way. Uh, that's a really great question, actually. Um, if you are wanting to create a networking event um, on your own, I would actually ask you to interact with your student org. Um, if you are part of a student org on campus, um, usually having the weight behind you of a org that has multiple students on there can help you create or invite um, companies or other representatives um, from a student org, then you would probably talk to your career center, your academic center, um, and try to see if if you want to do something on campus, if they can help you out with that. Um, and then you can start reaching out to working professionals, right? Send them a message on LinkedIn. Hey, would you want to be part of um, my student org's 
uh, networking event. This is all the details. Uh, the more information you give them, the better it'll be for them. And that way you can really pick and choose what type of networking session you want this to be. Um, do you want it to be specific to an industry? right? If you want this to be an oil and gas networking event, you invite Chevron, representatives from Chevron, Shell, Halliburton, Baker Hughes, Schlumberger. If you want this to be um, a mechanical engineering uh, networking event, you can invite network, you can invite uh, mechanical engineers from oil and gas, technology, manufacturing, um, day-to-day, like different types of companies. If you create your own networking event, it's really what you make it, okay? Um, what's the best way to respond to being home for several years to raise a family? That's a great question. Um, when usually recruiters might ask that type of question um, at a interview, right? They're looking at your resume and they say, hey, there's been a couple years where you haven't been working. Um, can you kind of explain that situation? You can, you can say it very simply as I was taking it some time um, to, to raise my family. Very simple. You don't have to expand more on that. You don't have to give any other personal reasons why. Um, you can say it very simply as to how you've, you've written out your question. I took, I took several years to raise my family. Um, being a working, uh, focusing all your, your time, um, on raising a family, that is, in my opinion, like a full, that is like a full-time job. <laughs> Being a head of household, raising, uh, raising kids and dealing with your spouse and all of that good jazz, even if you're not dealing with your spouse and you're a single parent, um, that's a full-time job. You're basically CEO of a household, right? Um, so you can take it as a joke with that. You can tell them, oh yeah, I was the CEO of my household or I was CEO of the Martins family. Um, so I've, I've had students joke around with it. You don't have to give, you want, if you want to give a full explanation, hey, X, Y, Z happened and I had to take some time to take care of my family. Um, that's totally okay, but you don't also have to go super in depth about it. Uh, what advice do you have for the non-traditional student who has years of work, wide and shallow experience and is looking to enter a new field for the school that they they just went to school for. Um, I love non-traditional students because they have a different way of thinking about situations that, you know, traditional students would not have thought about. They might think about, you know, ergonomic. Uh, with engineers, I always see with ergonomics. Uh, when I worked in a manufacturing company, they would almost always hire a, a non-traditional students because they've had um, hands-on experience in different different avenues of life. Um, I, I, if a recruiter asks you why you're making the switch, just say, you know, I found a new passion um, and I went to school for it and that's that. I don't think you have to go more in depth about it. I think a lot of times it, in general, when when students are deviated with their questions, um, deviated in their work history, they tend to overanalyze the situation and give a lot more um, information that, than is really needed because you're trying to justify yourself. I don't think you need to justify yourself all the time. Short and simple answers work perfectly. And if the recruiter asks you to expand on it, then you can expand on it. But don't word vomit um, for the sake of answering the question because they might not even ask for the full full answer, the full reason. Um, is it acceptable to mention any personal experience such as losing a spouse that has affected you profoundly and illuminated just how hard working, resilient, and dedicated you are? It's absolutely acceptable. Um, going through personal tragedies is such is an experience that not a lot of people can relate to and not a lot of people can, but, but a lot of people can understand, right? Um, they can understand the hardship and you can use that as a growing experience. You could say, if, if the, if the recruiter asks you, tell me about a time you've had, you've, 
you've struggled in X, Y, Z, because this is the question that I actually ask um, for my behavioral interviews. Um, you can say, hey, I haven't really dealt with this situation because um, I haven't been in the workforce that long or I've taken a deviated route to getting my degree. But in my experience as a blank or in my experience dealing with the loss of a spouse or a family member, it forced me to do X, Y, Z, which showed my resiliency, which showed my leadership capabilities of taking care of a household, all that good stuff. So you can turn it into that advantage um, by saying, yes, I don't have the work experience, but I have this. And this is just as good as work experience, but I didn't get paid for it. Um, what are some bad, good or bad networking experiences you've had from a recruiter's perspective? Whew, I'm sure Meredith can agree with me, but we can write a book about the about bad networking experiences I've had. Uh, this kind of, for me, <laughs> uh, ties into um, the sweaty hands thing, but I had a student that was so nervous and so anxious that they were sweating everywhere and at one point had sweated onto my sheet of paper that I was carrying and after my interaction with him my like half of the paper was just soaked with his sweat that was pouring off his head and I felt so so bad but it's also something that I will never forget unfortunately he is permanently stuck in my mind as that sweaty kid which is why I always tell students wipe off your hands right before um, you go in for that interaction with a recruiter but I've also had tons of great experiences there is literally um He's, he's an a &M kid, he's an Aggie kid, but he, he attended every networking session that I held on a &M's campus. He added me on LinkedIn, he messaged me on LinkedIn, we sent emails back and forth. He didn't get an internship with us one year, but he maintained that relationship going forward that that next year I was like, if I don't get this kid an internship, I'm gonna hate myself. And I fought for him to get an internship. He got an internship with us and he did so amazing. They wanted to give him a full-time offer even before his summer internship ended. And if it wasn't for his persistence and if it wasn't for his tenacity, he would not have gotten that internship and possibly the full-time offer right off the bat, right? So I think it's so important for students to be um, dedicated and to be persistent um, in their search for an internship or a full-time opportunity. That's all the questions that I have. <laughs> um, any other questions, comments, concerns? It looks like they've all come in. I mean, y'all, you guys sent in eight questions. That is fantastic. And we appreciate it. I will add, uh, just like Amanda said, we have had, we could write a book with the experiences of networking and really resumes and interviewing and all of the above. But for every bad experience we remember, there are probably three to five good ones um, that are really Absolutely. great. Absolutely. And so, Amanda, thank you so much for coming and presenting on my favorite topic. Um, I love networking. I think networking is really the key to finding you the perfect fit in your career. And so thank you for presenting that to us this evening. Uh, if there aren't any more questions and we haven't had any come in, then we will go ahead and sign off. Guys, Amanda will be back for part four, the same time, same day next week. All right, and so that part you are not gonna wanna miss because this can really set you guys up for the rest of your career search and your career searches for years down the road when she talks about how to accept and decline offer letters. So Amanda, thank you for joining us. Let us know what we can do to help and improve them by filling out our survey. And outside of that, we will see you guys next week. Yep, and I've added my email as well. So if you guys need to email me for any reason, you're more than welcome to. Fantastic. You guys have a great evening. We'll see you next week.